Hey everybody, Jonathan here from AJ and Smart. And like everyone else right now in the world, I am working from home. We're still running sprints, you know, we're still doing everything we usually do, but at home. Now, a lot of people have been asking us, how do we run remote sprints? What are the tools we use? How exactly do we transform the things you do in an in-person design sprint into this sort of digital whiteboard? And how do we deal with clients? How do we onboard? All of this kind of stuff. And the other day, what we decided to do is make one of our private paid live streams. So we have this online course called the Design Sprint Masterclass. In the Design Sprint Masterclass, we have the information on the tools and everything we use for remote sprints. And last week we did a live stream and decided to make it public, decided to make it free because so many people are struggling right now to run workshops uh, online. So what you're about to see, just for some context, is an excerpt from the live stream uh, with myself and my colleague Tim running people through how we run remote design sprints and the tools we use. I think it was a great look inside how we actually run remote sprints. So I hope you enjoy it. And I'm sorry about the quality of this. I know this is not a normal AJ and Smart video, but these are not normal times either. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you enjoyed. If you have any other questions about remote sprints, make sure you leave a comment down below, give us a like, and if you find us on LinkedIn, you'll also find a lot more stuff on remote sprints as well. We're posting pretty much every day. Uh, we're also doing live streams the entire time. Check us out on Instagram at AJ Smart Design. Um, yeah, thanks so much for watching and thanks for your support as well. So first of all, AJ and Smart, if you, I think if you're in this live stream, you know who we are. Uh, we're a digital product and innovation studio based in Berlin. Uh, our clients are all around the world. And because of that, we've always had to work remotely. So occasionally, you know, like, I think in our sprint, if we look at the full four weeks of how we do our sprints, which we can explain later, only two days of those four weeks are necessarily in person. So like 98% of our sprints are actually remote. Um, and we never, we never really detail, like shared the extreme details of that. And that's something we started to add to our online course now. But we wanted people who didn't buy the online course, who can't afford the online course, uh, which we totally understand as well. There's a lot of students following us. We wanted to give you guys the um, inside view of how we do remote design sprints. And then we'll answer some of your questions as well. Now, let's cut to the chase. And we'll kick things off by showing you how we run remote design sprints at AJ and Smart. We want to show you everything, the behind the scenes, uh, take notes, uh, take pictures. We're going to show you exactly how we run design sprints for the biggest companies in the world remotely. And we're more than happy if you copy us. We're more than happy if you steal exactly these templates. Um, please do, because this is a time where you're going to need to run a lot of remote stuff in the next few months. I'm going to hand this over to Tim. And Tim, who has been developing a lot of our um, the actual infrastructure for our remote sprints, uh, is going to show you how we do it. Um, so I'll talk to you all in a while. I'm going to sit back and drink some tea. So the first thing I want to show you is the um, structure that we use for remote sprints, um, where you will be able to see how we, um, yeah, how we make use of the time, um, how we organize the days. So I'm just going to share this, and maybe just give me. Uh, yeah, can you see this? Can everybody see this? Okay, perfect, great. So let's um, let's take a look at the structure of the uh, sprint as we are running it. We are operating with a four week structure, so we are never just doing like one one sprint week. Uh, we used to do this, but it just turned out to be very 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 stressful. Um, I think the first two sprints we uh, we ran. Uh, back in the day, um, are where like the standard one week sprints, and then we just realized how insanely stressful it is for an agency to do that. Um, I mean, Jake, when he came up with the sprint uh, process, he he was working in a very specific context of working with startups for, um, you know, like Google Ventures. So we had to adapt the the process slightly for um, for our purposes, and this is now um, what like a sprint package from uh, AJ and Smart looks like. So 
four weeks, the first week, um, and I'm just going to talk about the remote setup, by the way. So the first week is what we call the pre-flight week. It's um, when we are spending a lot of time uh, doing research, onboarding the client, and setting up uh, the project. So um, a lot of the uh, things you see on here are, well, actually, all of it is remote, all of it. So um, the blue chunks here are things that are just internal AJ and Smart, uh, you know, like team, the team is collaborating on specific things, sending out uh, invites, setting, setting up the project on Basecamp. The red chunks here um, is everything that involves the client. So um, this is uh, also the overview that we send to our clients before an engagement kicks off, because we want them to be very clear on uh, the specific times that they need to block to, um, you know, talk to us basically and you know uh, make time for workshops so the first two chunks here are one-on-one uh, -on -one interviews with the team um, we always try to talk to the decider or the you know the project owner first sometimes the decider and the project owner is not the same person in that case we want to talk to the project owner um, and then we're talking to all the other participants of um, the sprint. Uh, another thing that we are doing is sending out uh, a survey um, that I can show you later as well um, in preparation of these interviews. And this is essentially just, uh, you know, uh, like a five minute survey asking um, people to define the challenge a bit more clearly, um, listing the common problems they encounter at work, also ideas that they maybe have uh, or initiatives that were already tried internally, but some, for whatever reason, didn't take off. Um, then we spent the rest of the uh, week doing some internal research and preparing for the first remote workshop, which happens on Friday. And I'm going to talk about that um, in more detail later. Um, the important thing here is these four blocks on Wednesday and Thursday. So this is essentially when we already prepare a lot of the things that we are going to work with um, during the first workshop. So we call the first workshop the alignment workshop. And essentially, it's taking the first half of um, an in-person workshop Monday. Um, and in it includes things like talking about the map, how might we, um, can we, sprint questions, long-term goal, um, defining the target user, uh, things like that. <clears throat> and um, unlike, unlike an in-person sprint, we, we cannot ask people to, to sit in front of their computer for the entire day. So we knew that we needed to make a few changes and have more but shorter workshops. So the first workshop actually happens on this Friday, and it's pretty much taking care of the entire problem framing and defining the problem space that we want to solve for. Um, and we're also using the time to already kick off user recruiting. So after talking about the, the, target, um, uh, the target users, our researcher can already set up the campaign basically to, to do the recruiting. And if people are interested, I can talk about the recruiting as well. So all of this is happening uh, entirely remotely. Um, in the second week, we are doing two more workshops on Monday. It's the solution workshop where we are um, starting off with a, a recap, just talking about the decisions that ma were made in the previous week. Then we are doing uh, lightning demos, uh, sketching, and the sketching is happening remotely in the workshop with the facilitator um, giving guidance to the participants. How however, we are ending the workshop um, when it's time to create the final three-step concept. So this is um, uh, homework that we give to the participants. And um, we are giving them very clear instructions. And we are also uh, giving them a time box. So we are not telling them to you know, like, uh, do it, w do it uh, whenever you want, like as long as we get it in the morning. Like We're giving them a specific time when they have to send it in. Um, I mean, we're, we're doing this for the purpose of you know, forcing them to um, you know, just just do it as quickly as possible and not worrying too much about the details. I mean, this is also the reason why we're not doing the solution workshop on Friday, because we want to avoid that 
people spend their entire weekend, you know, sketching the perfect solution. And then in the end, it doesn't get chosen and then they're frustrated. So just to avoid that, um, we do this on Monday, give them a tie box, and then we tell them when this, uh, when the time's over, send a photo of your concept to the facilitator and then the facilitator will upload it to the board. Um, and we can take a, a look at what these boards look like as well. So Tuesday is when the decisions are being made. So we are, um, again, starting with the recap, then we're doing the art gallery heat map exercise, straw poll, decider vote, um, user test flow, and then uh, storyboarding. And that's how um, we end the first chunks, uh, the first chunk of workshops. Um, and the rest Chunk. of it is pretty much <laughs> the, the rest of it is pretty much yeah that's fine i mean the rest of it is really a standard design sprint for us i mean we didn't even change the timings too much since we are ending on a tuesday uh we have a little bit a little bit more time for prototyping and recruiting which is which is really nice um but yeah so um friday we uh spent some time preparing for the workshops in the following week and um, if you know, I mean, maybe you know the AJ and Smart um, design sprint structure. So as I already mentioned, we never do just one week of sprinting. We always do two weeks back to back. So the first week is for pure ideation, uh, defining the problem, coming up with crazy solutions, testing them. The second week is for iterating on these solutions based on the user feedback. So it's quite quite valuable. And um, this is really where we are taking advantage of having talked to um, five testers in the previous week, because now we can really um, work out the details that didn't quite work yet and yeah, figure out um, what we need to change to make this really a winning product. And we are running this iteration workshop uh, remotely as well. We don't need that much time for it because we're always basing it uh, on the things that were already created in the previous week. We already have a really detailed prototype to structure our discussions on. Um, and um, in, the, in the end, we're just very quickly sketching some uh, fixes and improvements. So then we are, um, yeah, we're, we're basically just going back to prototyping uh, the second version of um, the prototype, and usually this is um, this is where the prototype gets so much more valuable for clients because they they get something in the end that is a lot closer to a, a final finished product that they can then take to um, you know stakeholders and present their ideas back. Um, okay, and that's uh, so we're just running user testing on Thursday. Uh, maybe there's spillover on Friday, and then we prepare for the handover week, which is the last week of the engagement. And we are, so nothing really gets created in this week um, except uh, recommendations and defining very clear next steps for the client. So the first uh, thing that we do on Monday is run um, a short remote workshop session where we just uh, pretty much wrap up the, the sprint, talk about the feedback. Um, and then we also talk about um, like the biggest um, issues that remain open and need to be addressed somehow. And we're also trying to, you know, leave them with, with really solid and um, useful recommendations for, for the next steps once they um, end the engagement with us. So um, the rest of the week is really just uh, us documenting the sprint, um, writing out the recommendations, creating a final sprint report. If people are interested, I can also show what that looks like. Um, because we are already doing this remotely. Um, uh, we are not necessarily sitting in the same room when we're doing all of this work. And the entire sprint ends with a 60 minute wrap up call with the decider or sometimes the entire team um, uh, can also join uh, where we just uh, yeah show them the report and um, basically end the project at that point. So, um, yeah, I was. Um, yeah, I have already shown you like the the high level structure, but I think what might be interesting uh, before we look at specifics of you know running the remote workshop is how we do the entire onboarding phase, uh, and I would like to show you a couple of things here. 
Okay, so um, this is the um, pre-sprint survey that we send out to clients. Um, and this is usually uh, something that we send out after, um, you know, um, sending a really nice onboarding message to them. Actually, maybe I should show the onboarding message first. Let me just, ah, no, no, fuck it. Let's just continue with this here. So this is, um, so, so just assume you're the client, uh, you already know, okay, something is happening. It's called a sprint with a company called Agent Smart. I have no idea what's going, going on, uh, but I know that they will be sending me information. Um, and then you receive this kind of like overview with an email where we pr pretty much show them exactly what I showed you just a couple of minutes ago, this overview of the project, telling them when to block time uh, and also sending them links to the survey you are seeing here and also to um, a scheduling service like you can book me where they can uh, pick a time for a one on one interview. And um, the, the, so, what's really what's really important for us is to just pre to just to prepare for these interviews to already get some some insights into the challenge from from their perspective. So every participant is just answering this uh, survey, and it's re as you can see, it's really really short. Um, a couple of things that are important from from our side in terms of expect like managing expectations and also getting an awareness of like what is the client really looking for i mean are they looking to to actually create you know uh, a product immediately after the sprint is done i mean do they have like developers waiting or something like that or or do they want to you know like unlock a budget by presenting this to stakeholders internally this is um where we are asking them things like what are the top one two three things you would like to get by the end of our sprint together, um, and this is just a long, uh, 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 just a long form answer here. How will you be using the outcomes of the sprint in your role? That's also really, really important. And this one here is really critical for the user researcher. Who do you think is the target customer for this challenge? Because when we see that there, there's you know a, a, a complete alignment on who this is for. We can pretty much start recruiting immediately, even be before we started the first workshop, which is uh, which is really awesome. Because when you have done um, recruiting for user testers before, you know that it's super stressful to get these people in time. Um, and the sooner you start, the better. So this is a really good thing to to ask the um, the client. And if you see that there is misalignment on the side of the client, this is kind of like the first red flag that you will you need to be you need to be aware of that in the workshop and if you feel like you know there is a complete misalignment that you just need to spend more time on on hashing out these details um who are your biggest competitors with regards to this challenge getting answers on this here really helps us with preparing uh things like lightning demos in advance uh, of the workshop um same with companies that inspire them what do you think the solution could look like? I mean, all of these things are just uh, material for us to prepare for the sprint and to really understand um, what is really the problem we are trying to solve. Are there any um, any things that we can look at that already exist? Um, and what are you know like what are um, some things we can already prepare um, before uh, we start working with the client? Um, and there's a reason for that that I will be talking about when I show you the exact workshop setup that we have on uh, on my role. So this is the survey. Just assume that uh, both the decider and all participants will get them. Uh, and when we're doing the one on one interviews with them, we are pretty much just going through the results of that survey. Um, at specific times, we're just asking them to go a little bit more into detail uh, or have some follow up questions. And and some, sometimes it's just a sharing session where they pretty much just just dump everything that frustrates them about their, you know, uh, about the problem that they're trying to solve on us. And um, this is all really valuable because when we are doing these calls, um, we're always uh, recording them with uh, Loom. Um, you can see this little uh, thing up here. Um, let me just see if you can actually see this. Okay, I'm not locked in here right now. But anyway, Loom is a really good tool for uh, recording um yeah recording your screen and it's uh it's really cool uh when you're doing a video call 
uh, to capture to capture what uh, what is being talked about. And uh, of course, we're always asking for um, permission uh, when we do that. Um, these videos are then used by the rest of the team because not not everybody will be joining the calls. We try to avoid you know like having this pile on where like five people talk to one person. Usually it's the sprint lead and maybe a user researcher talking to them uh, one on one, and the rest of the team can still um, listen into the interviews. But usually the person running the interview interviews is also writing a very quick summary. And um, in any case, we have the survey um, to rely on as well. So um, yeah, how do we um, how do we do these interviews? So uh, we either use Google Hangouts or Zoom. Um, I mean. Uh, it, it really depends whatever is mo most convenient for the clients. Um, I should also mention that when we're doing these interviews, we are already, apart from talking about the problem and, you know, like how, like potential solutions and things like that, we are already trying to um, talk a, a bit about like what they can expect in the workshop. Um, we're not, we're not, already you know like talking about specific exercises we're basically just introducing principles like hey um, just so you know this is not just a conference call where you can kind of like put yourself on mute switch the camera off and kind of like do other stuff next you know like um uh, that is unrelated to the workshop you will have to focus um you will uh you can expect that um you know you will be working together alone so um it's going to be collaborative uh, and we're also trying to short, like, cut down on any unnecessary discussion just to, you know, like set expectations um, so people are roughly aware of what to expect. And we are also using these one-on-one -on -one interviews to do a very quick um, tech uh, setup check with them where we are um, uh, sending them the, the link to the digital whiteboard. Um, we uh, set up the communication tools and we just do a very quick trial tr trial run with them. Uh, it shouldn't take more than you know ten to fifteen minutes, but we are always planning um, uh, planning to do that in the one uh, one on one interviews because um, it's sometimes not feasible to get people more than more than you know like for sixty minutes in the first week, and we just try to get it out out of the way so that people can just focus on the workshop. Um, yeah, so tech setup, talking about the challenge, preparing, uh, and all. Uh, uh, yeah, all is well then. Um, OK, so this is the survey. Let me uh, end this. And then uh, if you guys are interested in it, you I can You gave open... me a moment. You gave oh, me a moment perfect. to come back. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tim, will you open up the Miro board? Mm. I think that's, that's the main, um, that's main what thing. I want to, yeah, that's what I wanted to do next. Um, oh, yeah. So, um, so it's, let's uh, do it. Let's yeah. do it. Let's do it. Do it. Okay, you can put me away again, Ryan. Bye. This is uh, the uh, template that we have on Miro. Um, and I created, uh, so this is the actual, this is the actual template. Um, I just made a copy uh, for this for um, this call, but I also created a version that is filled in that I will show you later, so that it becomes a little bit more tangible how um, how this is used. So um, yeah, as I as I already mentioned, we are using Miro, um, but uh, you know there are tools like Mural. There, like there, there, there's no shortage of digital whiteboards that are really, 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 really good, um, and in you can also get creative with this. I mean. If for what, like in, in one case, Miro was not an option for us, so we had to uh, rely on Google Slides to run the workshop, and it actually worked fine. It was not as it was not as nice as Miro, um, but yeah, you know, um, it still worked. So the important thing is when you're doing a workshop remotely, is um, you have to see what people are doing in in real time. That's really that's really the most important thing in like from our perspective because you're you're already physically separated. Um, you're sitting in front of a computer, and it's really important for these kind of workshops to convey this uh, notion of uh, working together towards a common goal. And this just doesn't work if you just send people emails with homework and then you try to consolidate everything. So having a digital whiteboard like Miro or Mural is really awesome. Um, the nice thing about Miro, and I'm pretty sure that Mural uh, offers this feature too, is you can specify 
a specific part of the whiteboard that people see the moment they are clicking on the invite. And in our case, it's called Miro Basics. And this is essentially what we run them through when we're doing this uh, tech setup uh, check in the onboarding call. The funny thing is that a lot of these digital whiteboards have so many cool features, but you actually don't need most of them. Um, and this is something that I would also like to 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 really uh, impart on you. If you're worried about like using a tool that is very complex, um, the the good news is that your participants don't actually need to do that that much stuff with the whiteboard. The main thing is um, being able to navigate the uh, the whiteboard, and they need to be able to um, you know create uh, sticky notes, uh, duplicate them fill them out and move them around. And that's uh, what we are um, kind of like training them to do here with this uh, setup. There's a bunch of other features that, that are only important for the facilitator, for, for example, starting a timer or things like that. Um, but the participants don't need to worry about that. I mean, you are guiding them through the process. So um, that makes it, makes it a lot easier for them. When we are talking about navigating the board, um, I mean, one convenient feature that uh, Myra offers is the uh, outline here. It's easy, so depending on how good your, your template is, it's pretty easy to just move through it like this, but um, you would be surprised how many people actually have trouble uh, with, uh, you know, like zooming and swiping on laptops. I mean. It, you you probably like a lot of like most of you probably have uh, you know really nice Apple laptops or um, something like that or some some PC laptop, but when you're working with corporate clients, you can assume that they will have you know like a Lenovo ThinkPad or something like that, and they're usually using Excel sheets and they have never used a tool like this before. So it's really important to assume that you have to teach them how to navigate the board. And to make things a bit easier, we created this outline here. So if for whatever reason they get lost, we can just tell them, hey, um, participant XYZ, can you please join us at the two-year goal? And then they click on that, and then they immediately zoom to the two-year goal. OK, so as I mentioned, all of yeah, all of what you're seeing now is the template that we create at the beginning of, of a sprint. So it's completely empty. Um, and maybe this setup is interesting to people. I'm not entirely sure. Um, we can also share that with you. Um, but I think where it gets really interesting is when we look at this demo I created, which is uh, a completely uh, made up product and client that I just created in uh, <laughs> in 30 minutes before before uh, this started. Don't don't focus on the content too much. It will not make, make a lot of sense, but uh, there is like a complete like lore behind it in my head at least. So um, in any case, um, when you're looking at things like the map, um, one thing that we notice is that uh, if you're just starting the map from scratch with the client in the workshop, it's super tedious. And you know, just getting people started takes time because you're always starting from uh, a blank slate. And um, this is making it really hard for people to structure their thoughts and conversations. So what we are doing is actually start the sprint <clears throat> with a prepared map. Um, so in this case, I you can see here this uh, target area that I, I can just very quickly delete that. Uh, and these here as well. So when we are starting the workshop, um, we would already show the client something like this here. And we tell them, look, this is just a draft based on what you told us in the previous uh, interviews that we did with you. Um, and we do this, uh, so we come up with these kind of like map drafts as a team. Um, and then we show this to the client and then we structure the conversations about the map around this. And usually people then start saying, yeah, here outbound sales, it doesn't really make any sense for us. and uh, you know, it's so much easier to uh, make progress on the map when you already have stuff on um, on the whiteboard. Um, and I would really recommend if you have the luxury of, um, you know, doing this in advance, you should always do it. Just expect that people will want to change things. It's That's completely fine. I mean, it's still about collaboration. I mean, it's, it's not about 
uh, catering something final to the client. It's really just a, a means to get them started to talk about the map in more in a more structured way. Um, so let's bring these things back. Um, yeah, same with things like uh, challenges and how might we. Um, when we start working with the client in a workshop, we already have a collection of how might we here. We have a collection of uh, two-year goals, sprint questions, all of these things um, are based, uh, you know, on things we talked about with the client in the interview calls. And in the workshop, we always give them time to read through the uh, prepared um, uh, artifacts and also give them time to add their own. So it's, um, it's a pretty good way to just get the ball rolling, basically. Um, yeah, let's see. So this, this is the map. And as you can see here, and this might be interesting for people as well, <clears throat> when, um, when you're using a digital whiteboard, you uh, usually have uh, voting features built in. So um, in Miro, it's uh, this functionality here. So if I, if I uh, let's say I select these uh, sticky notes here and then I create, um, then I create this voting uh, thing here, I can just very quickly say what people can vote on uh, and what the areas they, they're, um, they can vote on. However, um, so this is really convenient. Um, but we don't actually like doing it too much. Um, so this is this is a, this is just like our personal experience with it. Um, the the advantage you have when you try to replicate real real stickers like here um, is that you really get a sense of people voting and working working with each with, with each other. If you're using the voting tools. The advantage is that the vote the votes are actually anonymous, but you don't see people voting, and you just have this feeling that you're working on your own. So what we're doing instead is we prepare these um, little red uh, circles here. Just tell people to either uh, grab them and drag them to the sticky notes that they want to vote on, or copy and paste them. And um, this way, people can actually see like these red dots. Uh, building up, which is uh, which is really fun. I mean, I personally like personally, I, I I love seeing that build up in real, like in an in person sprint in a like a um, in a real location, um, and it's quite nice to just replicate that. Yeah, same here with the decider votes. We have already prepared these, and you might also notice that we are explaining the exercises on the whiteboard. So. We would recommend that you don't switch back and forth between a, a, like a presentation deck where you talk about the exercises and the uh, workspace, because every time you do that, uh, there will be people who are completely confused what's happening now, and um, uh, some people will, uh, you know, not go back to the um, to the uh, workspace. They will be looking at the video conferencing tool or whatever. And you, it's, it's just a lot of work for the facilitator to bring them all back. So we prefer to keep, um, keep things uh, contained to the digital whiteboard and just explain the exercises uh, in a more tangible way. One thing that might be interesting is uh, how the lightning demos look like. Um, so the way we are using lightning demos, and this is also something I should have mentioned earlier, lightning demos are also homework. So um, when you're doing the lightning demos, um, it's, it's usually something you can research uh, at the end of the first workshop. So, um, you know, over Friday or maybe the weekend, you can just think about like three different um, examples you want to show to the team. Um, if you want to get uh, special brownie points from the facilitator, you can also make a little uh, uh, like a screen recording or something talking about your lightning demo and um, then send it all to the facilitator and they will be adding it to the board. So we are we are by like it, it's on purpose that we are trying to structure the workshops in a way to 
um, let the facilitator do as much of this work as possible um, because we don't want to, uh, you know, ask too much um, of the time of the participants, you know, like uh, moving, moving things around or low, like uploading really big files uh, to the whiteboard. This is something that um, the sprint team can do um, internally. Yeah, the solution concepts, maybe this is also something that we should be talking about. As you can see here, um, we prefer to still do the concept sketching on paper with a Sharpie um, just be because it's, it's, it, it, it's a really nice constraint that forces you to be not too perfectionist about, um, you know, like almost creating a, a perfect wireframe just because you have a digital tool now and you feel like, oh, now I need to align all the left edges. And I mean, I am the most uh, obsessive compulsive person I know. So I know for sure that if I, <laughs> if, if I try to create a concept in a digital tool, I would already start immediately like, like going straight into UX design. And um, just to avoid that, we are telling people, don't worry, you don't need to do that in here. You can just do it um, on paper. Uh, we explain them very clearly uh, how they should be um, sketching these concepts, just like in a like in a in a normal in person sprint process workshop. Uh, sorry, in um, in person workshop. Um, and when they're done, and it's time uh, for them to submit their concept, they can just send it over to the facilitator as a photo or a scan. And if there's anyone who doesn't submit their concept by that time, it's it's perfect because we we have the time until the next workshop. The facilitator can individually check in and ask people, "Hey, um, what's happening with the concept? Are you having trouble?" This is actually something where the remote sprint offers you as the facilitator so much more leeway in helping individual participants make like like bring their vision across. Uh, where in a normal in-person workshop, you just you are just like on this really tight schedule, and you know, like you just have to get things moving forward. Um, you have you have time now to really help people individually, which is quite nice. So uh, then we have here a board for the user test flow. People, I mean, I think some people were wondering how do we do the storyboard um, exercise on here. Um, so. Uh, at Adrian Smart, we are never jumping straight into the storyboard. We're always kicking things off with something we call the user test flow. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail what that is. If you, you there are like tons of um, free resources out there where we talk about that process, um, but it's really easy to do uh, on a digital whiteboard. Um, the storyboard is then kind of like a mix mix and match of um, the user test flow, and um, the the artist is then doing something that we um, stole from Basecamp's Shape Up uh, methodology of um, product uh, management and uh, product design. Um, it's called um, breadboarding, and essentially, it's just taking these uh, very high level uh, sticky notes um, to like one more level of detail where you, where the artist is not drawing anything yet. They're just kind of like writing a list of bullet points of things that need to happen on a screen, maybe already with a couple of content ideas. If we're talking about like, you know, like what should the, what should the headline say? What, what is the label of the button? Things like that we can just do in text. And then um, if necessary and time permitting, then we can uh, also look at the key screens and kind of like do uh, almost like a, a wireframe version of the screen as a group. But this is really saving so much time and trouble and it's really nice. One last thing I want to show you before we maybe have time to answer some questions, I don't know, is the wall of justice. So this is, um, uh, the funny thing is, or maybe actually it's not that funny. It's just funny to me, but um, <laughs> this is actually the first time we started using Miro, and we didn't even do any. <laughs> remote work. Uh, yeah, we didn't do we didn't do any workshops remotely. It was always in person, and Miro. Um, the first time we used Miro was just to capture the feedback from users during the test, because honestly, it's 
it's such a waste, uh, wasteful procedure to write down the user feedback on these like green and red sticky sticky notes. Um, you know, usually people people have to run to the whiteboard. Things get messed up. You know, like uh, somebody like the the sticky notes fall down at the end of the day. It's super annoying, um, and you cannot sort them easily. And um, so we started doing it uh, digitally uh, on Miro. And you can see here what this board looks like. Uh, let's take, uh, so all of this is completely made up, by the way. Uh, uh, Jean-Jacques here, um, uh, assuming that we are interviewing this guy called Jean-Jacques, um, the person who is taking the notes during the interview can uh, create a new sticky note really quickly uh capture feedback it's 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 effortless it's actually a lot faster than doing it on paper and i'm the biggest pen and paper fan uh of all time i love sticky notes but this is the, uh, i mean objectively this is just superior and you should start doing this immediately um so you can see here we are kind of like uh, uh working our way um uh, down each row uh, and each of these rows here is like a, about a specific feature and uh, what's really nice here is that if you, at the end of the day, uh, zoom out, you can identify like trends and, and um, patterns immediately. And this is something that you cannot do uh, with the pa like paper sticky notes on a whiteboard because usually they're not like ordered in any meaningful way. It's just like a scramble to get them on the board. Um, this makes it really nice to see Okay, obviously there is some uh, some issue here. All of the testers had negative feedback here, and um, some of uh, the testers also had like very um, big problems with uh, the feature here, report creation, whatever that is. So um, this is really convenient. And the cool thing is you can also export this entire sheet um, and share it with the client. And um, this is really powerful because we used to just take take photos of the whiteboard but usually the tests would end in at you know late at night or something like that and then you have these really grainy pixely uh, horrible photos and it's just it's just so unprofessional so um this is really cool convenient uh, and i love it can you tell already um <laughs> so and this is um yeah this is the, the exact board that we are using for a sprint John, what should we talk about next? <laughs> oh my God, Tim, that was beautiful. Um, Tim, one thing that was unclear and maybe we need to uh, elaborate is what uh, what does the finished storyboard actually look like in the remote sprint? Yeah. So as you can see here, um, we are also utilizing like the sketches from some of the concept here. So, um, it, usually the most important screens are already, um, they're already in the winning concepts. And sometimes there are really interesting features or some uh, some concepts that didn't get uh, chosen by the decider have like the perfect headline or something like that. And uh, like the rest of it is, is you know, like we cannot, we cannot use any of this except the headline. So what we usually do in a, in an in-person sprint is we actually take scissors and glue and cut these concepts apart and then kind of like create these like almost like low fire wireframes on a physical whiteboard. And you can do exactly the same thing here. Um, so you can just take specific screenshots of like, hey, let's say I uh, I just need this filter thing here. Uh, the facilitator can quickly uh, create this um, or just, uh, you know, like do something like this here so that you can almost like build these um, uh, cells uh, just using the available, like the, the, the sketches that are already available. Um, and you can actually, you can actually like cover a lot of ground just doing that. Um, in some cases, you need to create new elements or uh, change something. And in that case, uh, like a digital whiteboard is also offering, um, you know, like specific things you can do. Like uh, maybe you just want, want to create, uh, you know, like a navigation bar or something like that. All of that stuff is pretty easy, easy to do. I mean, the like if you, uh, so the, the I think the, the reason why the storyboard is so challenging is not because you know, it's it's sketching or like you need to have artistic, hey, artistic talent. It's um, because it's, you know, like you just need to get aligned on what needs to happen on every screen. Um, 
you know, what is the content that needs to go up there and stuff. And the rest of it is like, if you look at like a digital product, a lot of it, like a lot of it is just like rectangles, maybe a circle here and there, but you don't actually need to be a talented artist to create that. Um, it definitely helps, but it's not necessary. And this is something that you can create quite easily in, uh, in a digital whiteboard as well. So one thing that is also quite cool, although it's a, it's a luxury to have that, um, we have, uh, we have uh, someone on our team who has an iPad Pro with um, some uh, sketching app that he can actually, he can actually um, share in um, like a video conferencing call and he can actually just be the artist just like he would be in an in-person sprint in a workshop because he can he has an app like a uh, like um, an iPad Pro he has the Apple Pencil he can like literally draw based on the conversations that the client is having um, it's not it's not always an option um, uh, depending on you know like the available tech and things like that but it's also possible. So um, I know that, you know, like you, not everybody has an iPad Pro, not every, like, so, but there are definitely tools that make it a lot easier. If this is not an option for whatever reason, um, just doing it like uh, with squares and rectangles and circles in the digital whiteboard is also completely fine. It's easy. Great. So let's answer some of your questions. Uh, and I'm going to be answering some of the top voted questions in the questions and answers section. Now, first question. Thanks for doing this. How do you break the design sprint activities for remote activity? So, so Tim, the question here is, which bits are online and asynchronous and homework? Yeah. And which bits are in person? Yeah, so, um, uh, so the homework is, um, first of all, researching lightning demos. Um, that's uh, kind of like what we give people as homework at the end <clears> of the first <throat> workshop. Um, the second uh, homework is creating the uh, the final concept, and um, yeah, this is this is pretty much it. So um, the rest of it is is done in person, uh, with uh, not in person, but like uh, like remotely in a workshop. Okay, Tim, um, wh when it comes to the the sketching, so the three part sketching, so actually creating the concept. Do people do that uh, in their, how much time do they have to do that? Like, do they do that yeah. like overnight or when do they actually do the, the sketching? Yeah, no, I mean, um, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, we, we just want to avoid people going crazy over the weekend and um, spending a lot of time on that. So we give them, I, so they have a little bit more time than usual uh, because sometimes they just need to do something or maybe they're just going off for lunch or whatever. We cannot control that, but we are just giving them a bit of extra time. Um, we give them, uh, so once the workshop has ended and we're telling people uh, to do the homework now, um, we usually give them like a, a time window of about like three hours. And then we tell them uh, at the end of the three hours, please, send your concept to um, the facilitator uh, via email or uh, however you need like the conferencing tool or um, whatever is more, more, most convenient. And this is usually, um, as I mentioned before, we are asking them to do that on, on paper with Sharpies and they can just make a, a quick photo with uh, their phone or a scan or something like that. So the, like I said, the reason we're doing that is we, we want to have this element of, um, you know, making something by hand and avoiding becoming too perfectionistic about like, hey, now I need to have like a rounded corner on this thing because it's a button. I mean, this is just like like going to co co like cost them so much time they can instead sp instead spend on thinking about like the actual product. Um, so this is the reason why we're doing this. Tim, how do we deal with technical issues quickly and professionally? So this has been a massive problem for us in the past during remote sprints where like the video just cuts off or like, how do we actually deal with that? Yeah, um, I mean, we, we used to have the exact same problems with uh, user testing. And um, so what, what really improved the situation for us was starting um, to do these kind of like pre-workshop uh, technical checks 
with uh, each participant individually, just to make sure that okay they can actually use the tool. Um, they have a good they have a good stable internet connection. This is also part of the onboarding that we specifically tell people you cannot actually dial in by phone. You you need you need a stable internet connection. You should get a quiet room somewhere. Um, and you need to make sure that you have a webcam and a working mic, and then we just test that beforehand. In, but there, there are still instances when there is issues. In that case, um, so we are running sprints uh, with two people, sometimes even more, but it's uh, like two people minimum, with one like lead facilitator and one co-facilitator or a runner. And the runner is usually somebody who is kind of like training to become a lead facilitator. So sometimes they're taking over specific exercises, but what they're mostly doing is like making sure that everything is running smoothly. So they're helping individual participants. If uh, they're also keeping an eye open, if, you know, like for example, somebody somebody drops out of the call, it's now their, uh, their task to um, help them join quickly and also let the facilitator know, okay, uh, Josh, we just lost Josh, and I'll just like quickly run. Can you maybe can we just maybe like take it take a five minute break or something like that? And um, usually that really helps. And I mean, the more I, I think this is an instance where you almost cannot over prepare. Um, the more uh, you you prepare and set up like a, you know like a fallback solution, the better, um, because there will always be problems in in that 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 you just don't expect and uh, can't be helped. Cool. Okay, so Tim, why, let's just put it to rest because actually it, it, it irritates me a little bit that so much of the conversation is about tools. Mm -hmm. Miro or Mural? Um, I, <laughs> they're, they're both great. I mean, I, so I don't it doesn't really matter. Have, it, it really doesn't matter. I mean, I, I know people who swear by Mural. Uh, I personally have never really used it. We like there, that, like the reason we like Miro is just uh, we we have used it for a long time. All our templates are in Miro. Um, sometimes we talk about like, hey, should we maybe check out Mural? And then we do like a side by side feature comparison, and then we realize it's they're so similar. I mean, this is not this is not to say that you know this is actually a good thing. I mean, they're really key, like like if one <clears throat> one of these tools improves. The other tool like quickly improves as well, tries to add whatever feature was missing. Um, they have like really like they're really both excellent products with uh, really good support as well. Um, I yeah, I mean my my personal favorite is Miro just because I'm more familiar with it. Um, but uh, Mural is amazing as well. And like I said, you can even use something like Google Slides in a pinch. Like yeah. if, if there is, like we we sometimes have clients who, for whatever reason, cannot use either Miro or Mural because they just uh, just like this year they were able to convince their IT department, hey, how about you allow us to access like Google tools? Uh, and in that case, we can actually use that. I mean, um, it's not it's not optimal, but um, there are other ways of doing it. You could even use something like Figma, to be honest. I mean, uh, it's it it really doesn't matter too much. So, and and in the case of Miro versus Mural, I don't really want to make a, a call on that. Fair enough. <laughs> that great. Um, um, Tim, Tim, honestly, like if you had to choose between fully remote or the way that we usually do it yeah. pre coronavirus, which is 90% remote mm. and then some days in person. What's yeah. actually your preference? Yeah, uh, maybe in, in person with a hazmat suit or something like that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so it's really it's really tough because I mean, uh, like there, there are like pros and cons for both approaches. I, I, I mean, I personally love interacting with clients in, 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 in a physical location, you know, like building oh. this report with people, <laughs> like, uh, you know, like <laughs> workshopping with them. Um, it's 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 cool, and you actually have this feeling of kinship and uh, teamwork. Um, however, it's also very wasteful. You know, like flying around the globe, either yeah, them is. doing that, or or sometimes we fly as a team. Um, it it always like this is actually something that bothers me uh, uh, quite a lot, and it's also stressful. Um, it's very wasteful. It's stressful. And um, I mean, I, I personally would still like to always have some sort of in-person component, 
but it doesn't mean that every sprint has to be in person. So um, we have we have done some in person sprints with clients that we built a really good relationship with, and every sprint after the first one was fully remote because we had already built the report with the team. Yeah, we we know like they know they can trust us. We know we can trust them that they you know like that they will also um, you know like heed our guidance and our advice. So um, I'll I'll just be I'll just stay a, a fence walker. Uh, <laughs> No, fence sitter, right? Fence sitter. I'll actually tell you the, the software that we use for running sprints in general. We use Basecamp for all client updates. So Basecamp is almost like the Basecamp for all of our projects. So we don't use email with our client. We're using Basecamp. Um, then we use Miro for the digital whiteboard. Uh, Tim, what, what's the current video conferencing software that you guys like the best? Uh, Zoom. Zoom. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Same. So, so it's 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 either uh, Hangouts or Zoom, but um, yeah. I think Zoom is becoming a, a favorite of ours, just because most most clients we work with already use Zoom, um, and it's incredibly robust. So yeah. we um, we just like every day we're doing like a little uh, uh, agent smart company Hangout on Zoom yeah, with like crazy. Uh, twenty people joining, um, and it's. It doesn't slow down. It doesn't lag. It's it's really good. It's and and you can have some fun with it as well. I mean, it's it's just a, a really good tool. Um, works works amazing. I mean, I personally find the UX uh, very confusing sometimes. Still, Zoom's UX, yeah, it's very yeah. yeah but uh, once you get a hang of it, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and what we're also using Notion for all our internal documentation. So how we document uh, like the versions of our sprints and which exercises uh, we're using Notion, um, and I think that those are and we're using uh, the sprint team is using Google Drive uh, for all the sort of just dumping information and, and collecting it. Uh, we're using Loom L O O M to record the uh, user testing. Um, and yeah, so yeah, basically, I think that's the core technology that we're using in the company. Um, and we use a Yeti mic. It's a really, really simple microphone called a Yeti, Y-E-T-I. Uh, that's the microphone we plug in because then you can hear everybody around uh, in, the, in the live stream. Um, and we're using a simple Logitech uh hd c960 or something, yeah, <laughs> something like, like that when you search logitech hd yeah. webcam you'll find it yeah. uh, so this so, is yeah. um maybe also interesting i mean uh, uh uh so where i'm working uh from right now is my home office and i don't have the proper uh setup that i i, I mean that i have at the office yeah. when we're doing uh when we're doing remote sprints we're usually still doing mm -hmm. it at office um but we have like a proper setup there with a really good webcam some uh light ring etc so that we have some really good lighting uh yeah and uh, <laughs> our internet is also a lot more stable there <laughs> yeah although it's not too i have to say right now even though every neighbor in my house is on netflix yeah. watching 4k yeah, footage same. it's somehow okay um okay so Thank you, everybody. We, I think we have three, 300 people still on the call, which is amazing. I didn't get through all of the questions, but we just wanted to blast out this live stream quite last minute, uh, give you a look inside how we're doing remote sprints so that you have a chance to do that with your clients as well. We have a massive amount of remote content coming up on all of our channels. Um, if you're not already listening uh, to the Jake and Jonathan podcast, get on there. If you're not already checking our YouTube channel, every Tuesday we have a new video, always free. Our LinkedIn channel is exploding at the moment. We just posted a free uh, overview of the strategy sprint. So 90% of our content is free. Uh, there's always like that last 10%, which we charge for just so we can keep the, the shop open, you know. Um, but thank you so much for everybody. Um, to everybody for being here. We really appreciate your time. I love you all. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Okay, so I hope you liked that video on remote sprints. As you saw there, we're using Miro or Miro, as Tim says, 
um, and that is sort of the main tool. We're also using Basecamp. We've got a lot of other videos coming up over the next few weeks, so make sure you subscribe to this channel. You can learn everything you need to know about design sprints, about being a workshop consultant. Thanks so much for watching the video. Let us know if you have any questions in the comments. Have a great day.